Hello everybody and welcome to another episode on my channel. Today we'll be doing things a little bit differently. We'll be looking at how to create a dividend growth portfolio that is suitable for yourself and your goals. So without further ado, let's dive right into the creation of a dividend growth portfolio. Let's make this a little bit bigger. All right, so first off, we need to know your goals. So everybody is gonna have different goals when they are investing. Some people may be saving up for a new home. Uh, some people are looking at retirement. And if you're going to be saving or investing for retirement, how long will it be until you retire? Are you starting when you're 50 years old and you have 10 years? Are you starting a little bit younger at 45? Are you starting, you know, a little bit earlier in your investing years? Are you maybe 30 years old? It's kind of my situation. Uh, or even are you even younger, which would be great. Are you starting investing when you're 20 to 25 years old? So is your investing time horizon a lot of years? Are you going to have 30 years to invest? So you need to know your goals and your investing timelines in order to construct your dividend portfolio. Now, my goals, what I have is I'm going to be retiring in 20 years, for example. That's my goal. So I am investing aggressively every month through my workplace pension plan and then also investing in other brokerage accounts in order to reach my goals of retiring in 20 years. Now, this may be different for you. You might be a little bit younger, 20 years old, so you have a lot more time on your hands in order to invest, which is great. That would be awesome. Or maybe you're a little bit later in life and you need to invest even more aggressively in order to meet your retirement or your investing goals. So step one is knowing your goals. Step two is knowing your circle of competence. So what is a circle of competence? So a circle of competence is a subject area which matches a person's skills or expertise. Now, what they mean by this is what are you familiar with? What do you know? What is your circle of competence? So here's a nice graph. Very simple infographic, but the circle of competence is what you know. And then around that is what you think you know. So a lot of people think that they know a lot more than they actually do, when in reality, they only know a smaller circle of that knowledge base in great detail. So the first step is identifying what you are familiar with and what you are competent with or know very well. Now, this concept was developed by Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, and it's made famous by them because they invest in businesses that they understand, that they know. They're not going out after you know, these new businesses that they hear of on the internet that they're unfamiliar with and start throwing their money at them. They do not do that. They take the time to do their detailed research in industries that they are familiar with because they understand that if they invest in businesses or industries that they are competent in or familiar with, they have a greater chance of increasing their wealth or their investment portfolios over time. So again, what industries are you familiar with? And if you're, if you're not familiar with really any, you can always just try to get average market returns with no additional effort through investing through an ETF, which we will look at later. That's also been a great strategy for a lot of people who want simplicity in their lives. They just want to keep getting uh, exposure to the broad market. They just dollar cost average in, which means buy you know, increments in either monthly uh, bi-weekly or weekly increments of the market in an ETF. And that provides great returns over time as well. And it's no headache, very simple, and very easy to implement. And we'll look at that later at the end of the video. So let's get to the meat here, uh, the construction of a dividend growth portfolio. So we're going to use an example because I think that using examples are usually the best way uh, to learn. So first, we're going to have an individual, let's call him John. He's 26 years old, he just finished school, and he's now in his career. Let's say he's an accountant. He just finished uh, business school, he's graduated, he's done his CPA, and now he's working in his career. Uh, he saved up $10,000, and he wants to create a dividend growth investing portfolio. Great job, John. Love to hear this. He has the time to research individual companies, and he wants to invest in individual stocks. So right here, John is telling us, that he's going to have the time to research these individual companies and he wants to invest in individual stocks because that is what he 
is working towards building a dividend growth portfolio that is in line with his goals of researching individual companies and investing in individual stocks. So his first goal is to retire in 25 years. So he's 26, so he wants to retire around 50 to 51, and he's focused on dividend growth and capital appreciation. Hmm, sounds like someone I know right here. So he can accept lower yielding, dividend yielding companies, i.e. meaning he can accept having companies in his portfolio that do not pay as much in dividends now, but they have a higher potential for capital appreciation. So he's focused on his overall total return. So he wants a total return of a greater percentage than his actual current income. So he's not concerned with current income because he's, he's pretty young. He's not retiring. He doesn't need that income to live off of yet. He's probably going to reinvest those dividends that he gets into additional shares. And he's focused on capital appreciation of his companies. So now that he knows his goals and what his investing strategy is, he can now focus on his circle of competence. So to do that, he ends up examining each sector individually. So he looks at different sectors in the stock market individually. So what I've done is I've pre-made a uh, portfolio, assuming that he has his $10,000 to invest and doing it with the companies that he feels familiar with. So first, he's an accountant. He works with computers all the time. He l works very well with Microsoft. So Microsoft right here, as we can see, let's go look at Qualtrum. So this is my portfolio, one of my portfolios here that I share on the channel. So he goes and we look at Microsoft. So Microsoft, he, he is very familiar with Microsoft because he uses their office suite, you know, their Outlook, their PowerPoint, their Excel, etc. at his workplace. So he likes to invest in what he knows and what he feels competent in. So Microsoft develops license and supports software, services, devices, and solutions worldwide. They have productivity and business processes, intelligent cloud, and more personal computing. They offer Office, Exchange, SharePoint, Microsoft Teams, uh, Skype, LinkedIn, Dynamics 365, etc. Now they also are in the gaming space, excluding Xbox hardware, basically everything computer related Microsoft does. So he feels comfortable investing in Microsoft, and then he starts doing his research. So he starts looking at their revenue, how much the revenue has gone up over the past 10 years at about 10%. He looks at their earnings before interest tax and depreciation. It's gone up 14% per year over the past 10 years. Looks at their free cash flow. So he starts researching this company and he starts reading their financial statements, looking at their trends over time, looking at their dividend growth at 11.45% per year over the past 10 years. And he starts really analyzing the company. So he feels comfortable investing in Microsoft. So he decides, you know what? I want to put $1,500 of my $10,000 into Microsoft because I feel like they will have good growth over the next 20 years. Now, Microsoft, as it's in the tech category, this, you know, pays a lower dividend yield like we saw. If we just go back. So the dividend yield is lower at 0.79. So not a huge amount of current income but he's focused on capital appreciation as well. And Microsoft has returned very great um, stock returns over the past you know, 10 years. So as you can see, it's returned about 27.69% over the past five years. And it's, it's just kind of like been up and to the right. So it's growing very well for, uh, it's, it's falling very well in line with John's goals. Then he looks at Apple. So he's familiar with Apple. It's in his circle of competence because he understands Apple products very well. He has a MacBook, he has a Apple Watch, he has an iPhone. So he's very tuned in to the Apple ecosystem because he's also a consumer of Apple. So he then goes and does his research on Apple. And he can see again, it has a lower starting dividend yield, has a low payout ratio, but he looks at Apple and he says, you know what, it's a great business. Their revenue is growing tremendously over time. They are producing a lot of dividends. They are doing dividend growth at 8% per year. They have a lot of cash on hand and some debt. They are buying back shares at a very fast rate, reducing that share float or that share count, making him a larger uh, equity owner in the business over time. 
And like we said, he's familiar with their business. Their business, you know, they manufacture smartphones. They create the the uh, iPads, Macs. They have AirPods. He's a consumer of Apple, and he understands Apple to such a degree that it falls within his circle of competence. Therefore, he does more research on the company and feels comfortable making this investment. Now, CP Railroad. So he let's say he drives to work and he's stuck all the time at a train. This happens to us a lot here. He's stuck at a, at a train and he sees CP, that logo, right across the train uh, emblem. You know, when the train's passing by, it's imprinted on each train car. There's CP, CP, CP. So he starts getting curious and he starts researching about CP, Canadian Pacific. And he realizes that they merged with Kansas City and now they have a train line that goes all the way from Canada to Mexico. So he's very intrigued by CP. And he under, starts to research and understand more and more about the company. So CP is a railroad. It's very hard to break into this industry. And they have large moats. They have large moats, these businesses. We, they're the backbone of our economy. They tra transport you know, grain, other agricultural supplies, sometimes coal, uh, automotive parts, other consumer products. So he understands this as he does his research. And he decides, you know what, I'm going to add $1,000 of CP to my portfolio because it's a great company and I see it being around for the foreseeable future. Now he looks at his bank account. He says, oh, TD, TD Bank. You know, TD, I bank with TD. I have a couple accounts. I have a credit card with TD. Um, and I, I feel very great about their customer service. So I want to do some more research on TD. He says, okay, let's go and look up TD. So Toronto Dominion Bank, he looks up TD and he says, whoa, they have a higher dividend yield at 4.66%. So this is great. They'll pay him a lot of current income, but this is because they are a more mature company. They do not grow capital appreciation at those high, high growth rates of, you know, 20% per year. They're still steady, usually around 8 to 10% per year. And their total return over the past 20 years has been around 11 or 12%, if I'm not mistaken. So they're still a great company that fits in with his goals with his investing goals so he decides you know what i'm gonna add td to this portfolio because i know them i'm I, they're in my circle of competence i understand the banking and what they do so i'm very very uh familiar with them all of a sudden john's out one day he swipes his visa card and he looks at it and he says okay well i'm paying with my visa is visa a company i can invest in and the answer is yes I actually made a full video on Visa and how their business works, and I'll leave a link for that in the description below and a link in the top right corner you should be seeing now. So Visa, he understands, is a payment processing company. They are taking a percentage of every transaction that he does when he swipes his card. So as he does more and more research, he understands that this is a very great business. They have high margins and they do not really require a lot of capital. They are basically a money printing machine. So again, I encourage you to go look at that video I made on Visa and you can go check that out. So he decides to invest $1,000 there. Now, Texas Instruments. Texas Instruments, he starts reading an article, let's say he's on his computer about semiconductors. There's all these other semiconductor companies like NVIDIA and all these other things. Then he sees Texas Instruments and he wonders, oh, I would like to learn more about Texas Instruments. So he does his research. And then again, I made a video on Texas Instruments I encourage you to check that out. I'll leave it in the link in the description below and in the top right corner. But he decides that Texas Instruments, after watching my video, he decides that he would like to invest $1,000 in Texas Instruments because they have large um, operating margins. They're very consistent with their capital allocation. They are a great dividend payer and they have a long history of being a great total return, including the dividends and capital appreciation of the company. So a great investment. Now, John, like a lot of us, he goes with his family, they go to Costco and they spend thousands of dollars a year um, at Costco. So he decides, you know what, I'm going to do some research in Costco. And he, just, he finds out that Costco is one of the fastest growth companies there is out there. And it is an amazing investment. So Costco, he decides that, you know what, since I'm spending so much money anyways at Costco, I might as well invest in the stock because I understand their business. I understand that they require people to pay for memberships every year and just through that membership revenue alone they generate so much revenue that they end up being able to have share buybacks they pay out dividends at a high rate they are growing 
and their parking lot is always busy. So that's a great business. And John decides that that's something that he should own. Next, we have Lowe's. So Lowe's, you know, John goes there, he goes, let's say he buys a doorknob for his house or something. Uh, it breaks and he's like, well, I think I can invest in this company too. So he decides to do his research on Lowe's. Search, just searches up Lowe's and he realizes, okay, they pay a, a decent dividend yield at 2%. They have a low payout ratio at 41%. Um, they uh, have a low profit margin and they have a lot of debt. So maybe they might be good, maybe not. But then he realizes, oh, where do I go when I need things? I go to Lowe's or Home Depot for my home supplies. That's it. That is what you call a duopoly. Lowe's and Home Depot have a duopoly on the home building, home renovation markets. So John realizes this and says, you know what? I wanna invest in Lowe's. I'm gonna look at their revenue. I see that it's growing at a respectable rate. I wanna look at their dividends. Are they increasing dividends over time? Yes, very, very fast. And are they buying back shares? Yes, they're buying back shares at a huge rate. So he decides, you know what? This is a great company that I'll do more research in and possibly invest $1,000 into. So that is Lowe's. Then he has $1,000 left and he says, you know what? I don't know really anything else about any other companies or I don't really want to research that much any more companies. I feel like I've done my due diligence on all the other companies. So I just want to have, you know, a thousand bucks into a low cost ETF. So he says, I'm going to put a thousand bucks into SCHD. SCHD is one of the most famous dividend ETFs. A lot of dividend lovers love this. So I'm just here on the Schwab uh, site. And then I look up SCHD and I can look at the fact sheet. So he says, you know, I'm going to read the fact sheet and let's look at SCHD. So SCHD, the fund's goal is to track uh, the Dow Jones US 100 index. It's a straightforward, low cost fund offering tax efficiency and it serves as a part of a core or complement in a diversified portfolio. So this could be a core holding, it could be half of your dividend growth portfolio or more, or it could be a complement like John is using here at 10%. And invest in stocks for fundamental strength relative to their peers based on financial ratios. So here you have some info about SCHD. You have the expense ratio here. So that's just the expenses associated with the fund. So let's say, you know, you invested a, whatever, a thousand bucks, whatever, you'd have to pay like six cents per year. So very, very cheap to invest into. And then you can see the uh, investment style. So it invests in large value companies. And then it has the actual companies here in the portfolio. So the top 10 holdings here, you can see as of March 31st, 2023, Healthcare, AbV, you have Cisco in here, Texas Instruments, which we looked at, uh, Pepsi, you have UPS, Verizon, Coca-Cola, Pfizer, Broadcom, Home Depot. So a lot of household names and things that John might be familiar with already and he feels comfortable investing into. Also has the sector weightings here. Uh, the sector weightings, you know, in industrials, healthcare, financials, those are the higher, more mature dividend paying companies or sectors. And you have consumer staples, uh, technology, energy, consumer discretionary, communication services, materials, utilities, etc. So that kind of concludes John's first $10,000 investment as an example. Now that's with John wanting to do the research into all of these companies and this ETF and saying that he wants to invest into these individual companies. Now, what if you were somebody who just didn't have the time to do this and you didn't really want to do this and you're not interested in investing, but you wanted to still get great returns? That's 100% fine. A lot more, actually most people would be fine following investing in uh, dividend paying ETFs or in broad market ETFs. It all depends on what you wanna do and how much time you wanna commit to this. But most people would be fine. They just dollar cost averaging, you know, put a couple hundred dollars a week in there or a month or, or whatever you can. And then you would be getting the market returns of that ETF. So we're gonna look at one pop, uh, popular one here in Canada, VDY, the Vanguard FTSE. Canadian High Dividend Yield Index. And I'm actually just gonna click the fact sheet. It's a lot easier to just look at the fact sheets and they present everything kind of in one nice PDF. Okay, so this fact sheet is updated May 31st, 2023. We can see the ticker symbol is VDY. So that's the ticker you would look for if you're buying this. It's traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange. So here we can see the net assets and the management fee here very low still at 0.20 and the management expense ratio 
So that is the management fee along with the expenses is a total of 0.22%. So still pretty, pretty low. Uh, we can see since inception, the market return of this ETF has been about 8.64%. So that is still a great, great return. Scroll down. We can then look at some characteristics of this ETF. So this ETF has about 56 stocks. Now, price to earnings of 12, so a lot of uh, lower price to earnings companies. So price to earnings is uh, ratio is the uh, stock price or divided by or divided by the earnings per share of each of those companies within this ETF. So 12, that's a very reasonable price to earnings. So these are more mature companies and higher dividend paying companies. Now, the earning growth rate here, again, 9% per year. So that is uh, respectable. That's not, you know, 20% per year earnings growth, but 9% is still great. Now we can look at the sectors in this. And since this is Canada and it's high dividend, you know, in our Canadian economy, we basically have banks and we have energy. There's, those are basically the two main proponents of our economy. So financials, as we would expect, has a higher rating here at 54%. Energy coming in closer at 27. Then you have some telecoms, utility, consumer discretionary, and a little bit basic materials and some real estate as well. So th that's the sectors that we would be investing in into this ETF. Now the top 10 holdings, uh, you're gonna have Royal Bank being the biggest at 13%. It's the biggest bank in Canada, followed by the second biggest bank, Tron Dominion at 11.3%. You have Enbridge, CNR, Bank of Nova Scotia, BMO, BCE, TC Energy, Suncor, CIBC. So that's if you wanted to invest into VDY. So that is kind of how you could create a dividend growth portfolio by looking at your individual goals and trying to decide what you would like to invest in and what actually fits your uh, circle of competence and will allow you to keep up with it over time. So I hope you enjoyed the content. Uh, if you did, leave a like, uh, subscribe to the channel and leave some comments if, if you like. So that's kind of how you make a dividend growth portfolio. And I, I hope you guys have a great day. Thanks, bye. Please note, I'm not a financial advisor by any means. Uh, investing is risky. Please do your own due diligence as I am not liable for any of investing losses you may incur. Thank you. Bye.